Good. So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this year's uh, annual Knox Lecture, the, the, the main public lecture of Catholic Theological College of the University of Divinity. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us this evening. We're so glad that the uh, disruption of COVID and the new technologies allow us to perhaps be in contact with many of you who would not otherwise have been able to join us in East Melbourne for an in-person lecture. So the, the reach of this lecture has extended um, under the needs of the moment. So we're very glad for that because the topic is important uh, because our speaker is well able to address it and because the con this conversation uh, within the church is such an important conversation to be having. So we're very glad to be um, in a position to have this conversation together. But we're very aware of what a year it's been uh, and what a year it continues to be around the world. And while we here in Victoria and, and Australia are rejoicing in the relaxation of some health restrictions and a low incidence of the virus at the moment, we're also conscious especially uh, conscious uh, in the body uh, of Christ, that the, uh, that the impacts of the virus around the world continue to mount and in, in some parts of the world will be felt for uh, many years to come. So perhaps as we begin today, uh, our, our, our um, time together, could we just perhaps take a moment to be mindful, particularly of those who have died as a result of the coronavirus in this month of November, the Memorial Month of the Dead. Let us commend to God all those who's, who have lost their lives to this virus. And for those particularly involved in frontline care around the world. Lord, we pray for your love and compassion to abound as we continue to walk through this challenging season. We ask for wisdom for those who bear the load of making decisions with widespread consequences. We pray for those who suffer sickness and all who are caring for them. We ask for protection for the elderly and vulnerable that they not succumb to the risks of the virus. We pray for misinformation to be curbed, that fear may take no hold in hearts and minds as we exercise the good sense that you and your mercy provide, may we also approach each day in faith and in peace, trusting in the truth of your goodness towards us. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the countries on which we dwell and live and that on which our college is based, the country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin nature, nation, those who've walked on and cared for this land and waters for thousands of years. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. My name is Father Kevin Lenahan. I'm the master of CTC and very glad to welcome all of you, uh, many from many dioceses, from many uh, religious institutes. Uh, many of you involved, I know from uh, checking through our registration list, many of you involved in safeguarding in your own diocese or congregations or workplaces. And so very happy that you join us and bring your wisdom into this gathering as well. I'll introduce our, our guest speaker shortly after uh, Sheree addresses us. Um, there'll be a brief response and then uh, we'll open to the floor for some questions. So feel free to use the chat function. We're all experts of Zoom these days. If you don't, if you run your cursor along the bottom of your screen, it will bring up a, a chat a comment uh, icon. If you click on that, you can write, type in a comment or a question. I'll, I'll monitor that for questions, but then we'll also open the floor for questions at the end of tonight. So let me welcome our Knox lecturer for this year, Sheree Limbrick. Cherie is the inaugural Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Professional Standards Limited, has been since 2017. Catholic Professional Standards was established by the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference and Catholic Religious Australia to foster a culture of safety and care for children and for adults who are more vulnerable in the church, to develop the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards 
and to audit Australian church authorities for compliance with those standards. Cherie has worked for many years in executive leadership roles in social, service, in social services and before Catholic professional standards had, has been, had worked for Catholic care in Melbourne, uh, most recently as the Deputy Chief Executive Officer there in Catholic care, well known to many of us through the extensive work that Catholic professional standards has undertaken in, in education and in work with the standards. So we're very pleased that Cherie is with us tonight uh, to, to address this topic of safe church and to raise with us her, her perspectives on what we have learned uh, in, the, in, 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 in time, in the years up to now, and what lies ahead of us in the second edition of the standards. So Cherie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, lovely to see some familiar faces, even if it is via Zoom. Um, and uh, yes, I, I hope very much tonight to be able to address the theme that I set myself. Uh, so we will explore um, uh, issues around commitment, awareness and action in the work that we've been doing over the last uh, three years. Um, sorry, I will just share my screen so you can keep up. Um, hopefully that's working. Good. Great. So as I, um, as I begin tonight as well, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters of the country where I am this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I also acknowledge traditional custodians um, <coughs> and owners of lands and waters where everyone is joining us from tonight. Pay my respects as well to elders past, present and emerging and uh, commit ourselves to the ongoing work of reconciliation. I also like to start by acknowledging the lifelong trauma of abuse survivors, uh, victims and their families. The failure of our church to protect, believe and respond justly to children and vulnerable adults and the consequent breach of community trust. I will start with a brief overview. Um, Kevin's touched a little bit on uh, where CPSL came from and some of you online may, will have, be well versed in this, but we are a company that was set up in, in 2016 during the Royal Commission. Uh, we're owned by the Bishops Conference and Catholic Religious Australia. And we were given the mission as, as Kevin's already alluded to promote the dignity and welfare of all who come into contact with the church and her works, but with a special focus on children and vulnerable adults. Um, as you can see on that slide, we have a pretty eminent board. Um, we operate independently um, of the church. And to that extent, really, um, that really has given us the blueprint for developing the audit framework and approach and also in the publication of audit reports. And I'll talk a little bit more about both of those um, during our conversation tonight. Um, just to reiterate in terms of our, our mission and um, very clearly has been to um, foster a culture of safety and care for children and vulnerable adults. Um, and we've done that through five key um, purpose or five key objectives. So the first one was to develop this thing called the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards. Um, the second to provide support and training and help build capacity of all of the Catholic ministries across the church in Australia. Then to audit compliance, so to go in and look within um, dioceses, religious institutes um, and other entities across the church at how those safeguarding standards were being put into practice. To publish those reports uh, to really increase transparency and accountability and to provide advice to church authorities on, on all matters um, relating to safeguarding. So I'll pick up some of those um, purposes tonight. You'll see some of the, the fruits of our work over the last three years as we go through tonight. So really, we, st um, we talk about many of you who've come to our training will be familiar with this uh, infographic, um, but the data changes um, pretty regularly. So this really just sets out what we've essentially done under those five um, key purposes. Uh, really since February last year. So essentially 
two years of the three have we been um, operational and actually providing services. The first year we were developing the standards and, and consulting on those first version of the standards. So since February last year, we, we published the standards in May. Um, I'll talk tonight uh, about the evolution of the framework to cover vulnerable adults or adults at risk. Uh, that work is currently underway. And we've developed a range of tool, tools and guides and all of those are uh, designed to support church authorities to build capacity and really um, enhance the development of a, a safe church framework. And um, we commenced our pilots with a series of, um, uh, uh, sorry, we commenced our audits with a series of pilots uh, in 2018. And uh, we then started live audits um, where we would publish the results in April of 2019. Um, we, and we're currently in the field. So um, COVID uh, hasn't stopped us. In fact, it's probably sped things up a little bit um, for us, but we're currently working with 10 uh, different entities across Australia at the moment conducting audits. Uh, since April 2019, when we did our first live audit, we've published 12 audit reports. Um, and we've also published a range of materials aimed to help church entities um, get a better understanding of how the church is traveling, what we're learning as a national body. So we've published reports about what we've learned from our learning and development strategy. We published a report on the findings of the pilot audit and um, in August this year, we published a sort of summary impact report on the first 18 months of our operations. We also periodically um, publish participation data. I'll show you some of the most recent data in a moment. And then if you come across to the bottom um, uh, left-hand corner, in terms of our improvement, so um, the whole design of how we've implemented our approach has been to develop the standards um, to support the implementation, to then go in and look at how they're actually operating on the ground, to learn from that and then be able to both target our further development, but also our resources to meet any gaps um, that are emerging as we conduct the audits and understand how things operate in um, the myriad of different ministries across the church. So in terms of our um, training and education, we've had... Um, nearly more than 2000 people now through a range of training face-to-face. -face. We now do a lot online, uh, including uh, specific webinars and tailored workshops. Daniel, who's our safeguarding uh, director, who'll be familiar with many of you, has just finished three days of specific workshops with Caritas. Um, and we've also been looking at um, specific resource development in partner partnership with various entities, but. ACU and CCI are, are two of the current ones we're working with. So in terms of the standards, I, I'm not tonight gonna to go into the detail, but just for those perhaps who aren't um, in, uh, intimately engaged in the content of the standards, essentially they look at four key elements of any organization. So the first thing is we're looking around our leadership and how we monitor and improve leadership for safeguarding. So how are we championing as, as leaders in any entity? How do we build a culture of safeguarding? How do we ensure that we're um, clearly communicating our commitment to zero tolerance of abuse? Um, and how do we uh, support all aspects of our ministry, no matter what it is as leaders, to be really as, uh, as safe as possible? The second element is all around engagement. So engaging with children, with families and with communities. Um, and that is actually a bit harder than it sometimes might seem. And as you'll hear later, that's an area that we've, we're seeing um, we need to provide some extra support and expertise. It's, a, it's an emerging area. So how do we really um, engage and listen to children and have them uh, developmentally appropriately, how do they influence our practices and um, make sure that at what we're doing to keep them safe actually is working for them. How do we talk with our families and engage with families and the broader community? The third element is all about us as the people in our ministries uh, and services. So essentially, have we got the right people? Are we screening and um, bringing uh, volunteers or 
um, those who are ordained or vowed or lay workers for the church, how are they brought into the organisation? Are they the, the best fit? Um, are they in the right role? So if they're working specifically with children, are they the right uh, person to be in that role? And then do they have the right knowledge? Are we supporting them uh, to develop the skills and knowledge to be engaging and working and ministering safely with children? And then the fourth aspect essentially of the standards is really the systems and policies and procedures that underpin those other three elements. Um, and uh, a couple of those will become obvious when I go through some of the data in a moment as well. So that's essentially what we're talking about um, when we're talking about the, the standards for those who haven't um, dealt with them in great detail. Um, in terms of um, what, how those, well, what those standards really, where they came from and what they're trying to do, the Royal Commission uh, into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse gave us a very clear blueprint for a child safe organisation. They talked about these five key elements and they, these elements are very clearly articulated in, in the standards. So the first one is to create a child safe organisation, we're really talking about an environment where a child is at the centre of the values, thoughts and actions of that entity. Um, so anything we're doing, uh, particularly where we have a ministry, obviously with children, but even not, even our ministries with families, there will be children in the, in the, um, you know, in the outer ring, outer circle, if you like, of the ministries we're offering if we're supporting families. So it's still also being quite clear and child focused. The second element is a child safe organisation places an emphasis on genuine engagement and valuing of children. And again, I'll come back to that. So it's not, it's not just as simple as asking children a sort of, you know, satisfaction survey. Um, it's much more uh, genuine engagement and, and children experiencing being valued within um, the service and within the organisation. The third element of a child safe organisation is one that creates the conditions that reduce the likelihood of harm so really very aware of um, the potential risk to children and what might cause harm. Um, and therefore that awareness means that you can then reduce the likelihood um, before, it, before it occurs, before it manifests itself. And again, the standards come at this in a range of ways, uh, thinking about physical environments, our online environments, um, this and again going back to our people as uh, key resources in our organisations as well. The fourth element is that an org child safe organisation creates the conditions that increase the likelihood of identifying potential harm. So this really is also about educating our people and giving them the confidence and having the culture that allows people to speak up and children and families to come forward if something isn't right. So a culture that is open and transparent and that people can trust when they do come forward um, and identify a potential harm that that will be responded to. And the last element is when uh, something does happen and things will still happen. So people will still have concerns. There will still be uh, times when uh, people are not appropriate that the organization is able to respond appropriately. So in a timely way, in a compassionate and pastoral way, um, and again, putting the child at the center of that response um, and making sure that the child and any other children's safety is paramount in our response. So those five core elements are really um, uh, embedded across the standards, if you like. So that's just a very, very quick snapshot of what in the context through which um, the rest of my talk is going to be really. So what I've put together tonight is, is a range of data. Some of it is, is already available, but you may not have come across it. Some of it is about to be published in our upcoming annual report. Um, so some of it's a bit new, but really it draws on and looks at, I'm trying to look at the, the theme of commitment, awareness and action through our engagement with church authorities over the last two years. So we'll start with commitment. 
Um, so this is uh, drawn from our uh, yet to be published, most recent participation data. So we publish this data about every two to three months. Um, and it essentially picks up uh, and depicts who or we, the number of entities across the church that are engaging with CPSL in, in the process of um, safeguarding. So 60% essentially of Catholic uh, entities, we're talking about 264 individual entities, and that includes dioceses and, and epikies, members of Catholic Religious Australia, other religious institutes that may not be members of, of CRA, ministerial public juridic persons, associations of Christ faithful, and a range of other um, organisations who identify as Catholic. So out of the 264 entities in our database, 60% have engaged with us in the last two years. Now, the majority of that engagement has been through training. Um, uh, in fact, I think almost 100% of those, uh, that 60% have all been to training. A smaller cohort of those have um, been working with us towards developing or undertaking an audit. So uh, this graph just shows you what happens when um, an entity uh, engages with CPSL. We develop what's called a service agreement. The service agreement is for the audit. Um, anyone can attend the training, but the service agreement is the pathway into the audit. Um, so you can see there um, we've had, Kathy Jenkins, you're drawing on my presentation. <laughs> um, so we've had, um, uh, 27, oh no, sorry, let me get this right. Uh, we've had um, 16 dioceses um, work with us and start developing a service agreement. So seven have a completed executed service agreement. Most of those have already had an audit. Um, and there's nine that we're in, nine other dioceses that we're working with at the moment to develop the um, uh, service agreement for an audit. Uh, most likely next year, most of those. And then you can see the religious institutes. We've got service agreements with 20 um, and uh, with 21 in development religious institutes. So about, about a quarter of those who've come to training have now are in the pipeline for developing the audit and so the service agreement for the audit. And then of the audited entities, so this we're sort of honing down into a smaller number. So there's actually 20 that have completed um, or are, sorry, will have completed an audit by the end of 2020. So as I said before, we're currently working in the field with about 10. Um, so actually it should be about 22. We've published um, 12 audits already, 12 reports already. Um, so a few of those others, um, there's some numbers there, the four entities that participated in the pilot audit are also in there. Now the category system, for those who aren't aware, basically a category one is um, any ministry that is working directly with children. So a diocese is considered a category one. It's, a, it's obviously has ministries with children. And, but then the religious institutes, as you can see, some of them, 10 of the ones we've audited have been classified as um, working with children. So they are um, clerical religious orders um, and also some of the larger um, uh, brothers and religious sisters. And then uh, category two, the seven uh, religious institutes in category two are typically those that perhaps in the past had ministry, may have had ministry with children, such as education um, or a social service of some kind, but they no longer govern those ministries. They're now in, in the management of a public juridic person or something. And so their members are typically of those category twos. They've been mainly retired um, or in um, ministries that are governed by others. So they might be volunteering uh, in some other sort of ministry that the sisters or the brothers um, don't necessarily manage themselves. So they're typically smaller and not as actively engaged with children. So that just gives you a bit of a sense of from the, the big number of 260, um, about 60% of those have accessed us for training and support. And then of that, about 22%, nearly a quarter, have started talking to us about uh, a service agreement or have a service agreement 
And as I said, about 20 will by the end of this year have come, gone all the way through an audit process. So now I want to um, talk a little bit about awareness. Now these, this information comes from two sources. Um, this is both from the training that we've conducted. Remembering back at the start, I said we've had about 2,000 people now through um, different forms of training with us over the last two years. Um, and also some of this comes from those entities that we have already audited. So um, the information comes really from a, quite a grounded place of those we're engaging with. So to start with, these are the key areas where we've seen um, really very strong um, knowledge development uh, and um, increasing maturity in the approaches to these issues. So for starters, the types and signs of abuse. So um, we've uh, both had people come to training and, and learn this, but also as we do the audits, we're getting very strong feedback from those who we interview. So for those who haven't been through an audit, um, we don't just look at policies and procedures, we actually talk to people. So we do a range of interviews in parishes, we meet with parish councils, parish priests, maybe some volunteers from the parish in a religious institute will interview a percentage of members of the institute. Um, in a diocese, we'll also meet with uh, key leaders and staff. So we're actually trying to get a sense of have has the education and knowledge actually gone beyond key leaders or those who might come to a training session? Is this now embedded and starting to be understood across um, the breadth of our ministries? So um, we've seen really, really um, strong uh, knowledge uh, and awareness, which is important to the types and signs of abuse. And if you go back to what the Royal Commission said were some of the critical things, this sort of knowledge is critical if we're going to be able to robustly respond should there be a, um, a, a situation of abuse within one of our ministries. Linked to that is um, the grooming behaviours. So um, I've been able to identify and understand um, what this notion of grooming is and how that, how a, a perpetrator of abuse um, may go about grooming. We ran also a series of um, webinars earlier this year that really focused not just on um, helping people understand the grooming behaviours, but actually was all, all about how to interrupt those sorts of behaviours. So how do you, um, you know, speak up when something uh, isn't right or you see something that looks very much like a grooming behaviour? Um, and we had very, very strong feedback from participants in that, um, in those series of webinars, and we'll be making them broadly available um, before the end of the year. E-safety um, is also obviously an emerging issue, but there is increasing knowledge. It, it'll also show up in a minute in the, um, in sort of areas for development. So it's not yet 100% across the board, but we are seeing um, people doing some really uh, good work around understanding um, and developing some comprehensive responses to the risks of children on, online and actually to um, also to members of um, congregations and institutes as they age. Um, child to child abuse is another area that people are very keen um, to develop information, uh, sorry, knowledge. Uh, and again, we've, we've offered some um, expertise in that area. That's a particular challenge. Uh, obviously, one of the main areas of challenge for that is within the school context, um, but it's also in, in youth ministry. Um, we've been, we've just done um, some work with ACU to uh, work with a group of young people or children and young people engaged in a parish. Uh, the children were aged from about 10 to 17. Um, and ACU were looking to work with those children about um, getting an understanding of their perceptions of safety within a parish context. So there were children who were part of children's liturgy. There were children who were in a parish youth group. Um, there were children who were, you know, students at the parish school. Um, and the, the children themselves identified other children as one of the key things where they don't feel safe. So this bullying and... Um, uh, sort of that sort of culture is a is a real issue for children today. 
Um, engaging and listening to children, I'll talk about that in a little while, but we are seeing some great emerging practice um, around different contexts of ministries really um, engaging and, and listening to children in a really positive way. We produced a guide um, last year, how-to guide, which was very much informed by um, children themselves. We went out with the idea of developing a, a child safe or child friendly version of the standards. And when we engaged with children uh, across different ministries of the church, they told us very clearly they didn't really care what the standards said. They wanted adults to talk to them about their safety. So we then went about working with those children to develop up some activities that um, would be appropriate for adults and help adults to have the conversation with children about their safety. Um, so that resource we know is being used uh, in a range of contexts to really uh, get out and be talking to and listening to children. Um, just conscious of time. The other thing around awareness though, so they're, they're some of the strengths we've seen, some of the work in progress if you like, um, is really this notion of safeguarding is everyone's responsibility. Um, what does that actually mean in practice? It's a great tagline for us. Um, but how do we um, really uh, work to making sure that our whole community actually understands this notion of um, safeguarding of children and how it is everyone's responsibility? So how do we go beyond training leaders, putting resources and things out? How do we really... Um, support local communities in parishes, in perhaps dioceses that don't have as many resources as others, uh, in small congregations. What, do, what does this really look like uh, to share this notion of responsibility? Um, the other work in progress, I think, is this notion of who is a leader in the church. So I suppose I'm relatively frequently surprised um, when I might start talking about leaders and people will quite quickly uh, defer to and say, oh, that's the bishop's our leader. Uh, and these are people who are senior in education or in Catholic care and social services. Um, so trying to challenge that notion of saying this isn't just, um, leaders are not just at the top of the church, leaders are throughout the church and within our ministries and uh, all leaders really need to um, play a role and that probably links to the previous point above about this notion that it's everyone's responsibility. Um, there is also increasing um, maturity. These next two, Daniel um, identified these, that people are starting to really understand um, some of the um, strategies, particularly around how we manage our people. Um, so I think for quite a while, Things like a working with children check were the safeguarding strategy. So everybody had a working with children check and then we're all good to go. Um, but there's a, a maturing approach to seeing that that's uh, certainly nowhere near a magic bullet, a working with children check. Um, and that there are there's increasing sort of sophistication in how we think about um, how we bring people into our organisations, what our screening practices should be how we can best support and uh, supervise people so that they are well supported to provide safe ministry. If we think about action, a similar um, process in terms of what we've seen in, in evidence in practice. Um, so there is um, consistent commitment, very good policies um, and really good, um, I've put their expert informed leadership. So. The standards really ask entities to have a, a pretty simple but um, a concept of a safeguarding committee. But on that committee, they have a range of experts that gives them, gives particularly the church authority and the leaders in that context, um, some expert advice around the safeguarding matters. And there's um, some really good work happening um, around the country in that sort of advice and exchange of expertise, which is fantastic. Um, records management is, um, is very good. So again, this, the standards really ask not just, you know, don't just keep your complaint files, but be keeping things like, you know, when key policies change so that as, you know, when you come back in 15 years time, you won't remember why you changed a particular policy or, or what happened at the time. So how you keep all those records, um, that's actually been a strength. 
there's increasing um, awareness and um, good use of professional and pastoral supervision. That was something in the standards that was seen as relatively new, particularly for um, clergy and religious, but of the audits uh, we've done to date, we've seen very strong um, professional and pastoral supervision practice and a really positive um, uptake of that as a, a really important supporter of people's ministry, which is really encouraging. Um, the selection and screening of individuals entering seminaries and formation programs is very, very different to how it was and, and what really the Royal Commission looked at in terms of some of the past practices. Um, but we've also been really um, grateful to be involved with um, the University of Divinity and CTC specifically and working with uh, some of the, or with all of the um, uh, seminaries around the country uh, in this last year, to, um, supporting some of their um, practice improvement and um, uh, subject to academic improvement as well. Um, and uh, complaints management also in the audits has, has really come out. It's clearly evident that people have put a lot of effort into making sure that their current complaint processes are um, vastly improved on what they used to be and what the Royal Commission um, ex you know, exposed. Um, so it's been um, very clear from all of our audits that complaints management has really um, very much improved. But again, there's still some areas for development in terms of um, actions uh, where uh, we've had a sort of ongoing dialogue for the last um, 12 months with a range of um, entity, mainly religious institutes um, who provide services offshore. So looking at safeguarding overseas um, and how we can uh, support um, those with ministry outside of Australia to also be promoting these um, child-centred principles. Um, risk management, um, so really, and really looking at risk management from the point of view of not, you know, the risk being seen to be, uh, oh, well, it's all too hard, we'll just stop that ministry, but actually a more sophisticated understanding of risk management to enable safe practice of ministry um, and there's a number of other things there. I'm just conscious of time, so I won't um, I won't drag on too much. You can see, but um, there are certainly a few areas that are still uh, in development, um, as you would expect, because this is quite a relatively new area in terms of us going in and and really understanding the practices um, and systems that are in place in the different ministries. So I want to take a little minute to talk about culture and then I'll um, move on to give you a bit of an update on where we're going with our um, vulnerable adults or adults at risk. For those who've been to training, I'm not going to teach you again, but in the leaders training, we use this framework around culture and we ask participants to really um, think about a culture that they want to create or a vision that they are, are looking to in terms of creating this notion of safe church um, and a vision for safeguarding. So this is the framework we use. But what I wanted to share with you was essentially the feedback that we get from training participants. So this isn't CPSL. This is what training participants themselves um, have told us when we do this exercise. And remembering we've, we've had, um, I think we're upwards of about 600 people having done the leaders session now. So this is a summary of um, 600 people's input into this exercise. So we asked them to identify the barriers um, to creating this notion of a safe church, a safe church culture. So um, as you can see, probably these barriers are no surprise to many of you um, on online tonight. Um, but so things like safeguarding being say, seen essentially as a ticker box exercise that that's a barrier and in fact what they want to create really is that safeguarding is core to the operations and really core to ministry. Um, upholding, you know, the dignity of children is uh, pretty core to the teachings of the church. Um, second barrier or the most, these are probably the top five um, barriers. So um, the sort of hierarchical structure of the church and the traditional modes of behaviour and exercise of authority and experiences of clericalism are seen as a barrier um, very frequently. Um, 
described most commonly the third one <coughs> excuse me is fixed attitudes so this sort of notion that it wasn't a problem for us so we don't have to worry about this we didn't have any cases so we're okay um, or it's not really relevant to everyone in the organization you know it, it's it's just we can just do it with just a few people focusing on it um, is seen as another barrier the geographical spread and diversity of the church and how you know how big and broad and diverse we are could potentially be a barrier and then um, the, the fifth most popular barrier so to speak is around mindsets so that notion that mindsets that either deny or minimize or avoid the issue altogether so just not not engaging with this as an issue at all was seen as a barrier but in this activity those of you who've done it will probably remember we also look at foundations and enablers so we don't just stick with the sort of the negative we try and then say well what can we build on so the foundations which we're seeing as we go around doing our audits and our um, uh, safeguarding work these, these all ring true as we go around the country. So there has been significant effort and improvement over many years, but particularly over the last few years. So there is a lot already to build upon. Um, the charism of religious institutes and ministries is quite often seen as a really strong foundation. Uh, and again, in audits, as we're doing some audits at the moment, um, quite often that comes through in terms of the charism and the spirit of the founder and getting back to that um, charism and founders sort of initial vision is very consistent with, with safeguarding and protection of children. Um, good social capital across the church, um, wanting to acknowledge the past to be able to inform the future. So not being stuck in the past, but making sure that we uh, acknowledge the past um, in order to build the future we want. And the church having really a rich history and a, a still consistent practice of working with children. And the other part of culture that we talk about is enablers. And obviously the gospel, gospel message is core to the church and that really is key to safeguarding. Um, so being able to both be an enabler and a foundation for building of a safe culture. Um, the person-centered mission of the church and also really the people. Um, we are, in a way, we, we, are the, we are the church and we are the enablers of this culture, um, not just leaders or others. It is everyone within the church. So I just now, that sort of summarises what, what we've learned really from our two years of focusing on the child standards and gives you a pretty, hopefully, a pretty good overview of what we're seeing. But I want to now turn to the vulnerable adults' work um, so just to remind you, this, this is the sort of current framework of the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards. So when we came to look at um, the extension of that work to adults, that's core to our mission. It wasn't just about children, it was also about adults in the church. So this was the sort of blueprint we started this project uh, last October, November, so about 12 months ago. Um, so we were looking to develop a, um, to see whether there was logic to have this single set of standards. So basically using the same standards of the child standards and, it, and broadening them out to cover adults. Um, we wanted uh, the framework to have a rights focus, um, to be trauma informed and to be strengths based. Um, we uh, determined that we didn't wanna be defining victims, if you like. We wanted it to be a framework that was about everyone having the right to be safe within the church, um, just as we said, all children have the right to be safe, and um, so do all adults. But then we recognise that there are some adults who may have um, uh, be more vulnerable or more at risk at times, and some of those things are permanent and some of them are maybe circumstantial or transient. Um, so where they may be for more at risk of abuse. We also really wanted to make sure that we engaged in this development process with those who have a lived experience of not being protected within the church. So with all of that in mind, we worked with the reference group to develop up and test the single set of standards approach, um, which the reference group supported. And um, we wrote the first, the first draft of edition two taking into account rights, trauma, um, strengths-based, 
um, and this notion that it's a it's the framework for protecting all adults with a focus on those who may be more at risk at, at certain times. So we went out and consulted. Um, this will, some of this data will be published shortly in a, in a summary report of the consultation. Many of you might have already participated in it. Um, so we had a few different ways of hearing from people once we put the draft out. Um, so we had 128 representatives of different church entities come to facilitated small group Zoom sessions um, to, uh, to give us feedback. We had 16 expert submissions, so experts including canonists, survivors, um, government regulators, um, the Royal Commissions, the Disability and Aged Care Royal Commissions and um, a number of others. And we also had an online consultation, so a sort of online survey and we got 107 responses to that. And that, that graph just gives you a breakdown um, of those 107 online consultations. So you can see we had um, people sort of self-nominated where they fitted, but we had people from ACBC and CRA organisations, but also organisations under those who provide specific ministries to adults at risk. So welfare agencies, health, aged care, um, we had a small number of people respond to the, this survey who had a lived experience of vulnerability. Um, and we also had a small number who were, who identified themselves as survivors or advocates or family members. But interestingly, we also had 34% of participants just identify as someone from the Catholic community. Um, so some of those were people in parishes, um, you know, workers in schools, um, various of them identified themselves, some were anonymous, but um, I think that was pretty interesting that we got a pretty broad range of feedback. Um, so to quickly summarise, I'm just conscious of time, Kevin will start to stop me talking soon. Um, so the feedback we got on the framework, which is, it is up on our website, if you haven't seen it, you can still have a look at the first draft, um, which is now in the middle of um, some pretty strong refinements based on this feedback. Um, but basically we got very strong feedback that we keep this notion of the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards and those four key areas I talked about are key. We, there's not two sets of standards, there's one set of standards. Um, we also got very strong feedback that we should move from the notion of vulnerable adults, which had been a term I think under towards healing. It was also within um, our um, constitution and various other documents and move to this notion of adults at risk, that that is uh, a more you know, contemporaneous and a, a more accurate description. Um, and we also mentioned right at the start this category system. So, but this notion of making sure that the standards could still be applied in what I call the best fit for purpose way. So that the standards be as, as refined as possible and depending on your ministry you apply in, and it's quite clear what in the standards you apply depending on the ministry um, you're focused on. We also got, um, so they were all um, positives. Um, we also got an um, feedback on a range of issues um, that perhaps are still under consideration. Some are pretty straightforward. So technical stuff like make sure, you know, the definitions are clear and we're not duplicating. So when we, those who did have a look at the first draft, there was quite a lot of duplication that's been stripped out um, and to make it much simpler. So things like that to simplify the, the approach itself. Um, the second issue was around making sure that this second edition of the standards also, um, it's clear how the standards work in partnership with other key documents of the church um, particularly around the National Response Protocol. And for those who don't know, the National Response Protocol is nearly close to finalised and that will effectively um, replace Towards Healing uh, and, and the Melbourne response as a, as a national response. Um, and there's other documents that are due for review like integrity and ministry. So being really clear. So we've spent some time since the consultation working with those who work on the National Response Protocol and others to make sure, for example, something as simple as our glossaries are the same so that we're not giving people mixed messages about what we're talking about. Uh, we got a lot of feedback about the timing of the second edition. 
people were conscious firstly around the two Royal Commissions um, and the, the third one being the Victorian Mental Health Royal Commission and that we the standards sort of don't then put the church in the position of having to recreate something if the Disability Royal Commission comes out with something later down the track. Um, so we've been working in the background with those Royal Commissions so that they're clear um, about what we're doing and um, hopefully they might actually, um, well, they're, they're very interested in what we've been doing. Um, so they may even adopt some of the things we've, we've or the approach we've taken. Um, and the other thing is that we need a clear implementation plan to help um, support church entities to build capacity, and improve their practices in line with these new standards. The fourth um, issue really came very strongly well, from a number of sources. Um, but that was to be very clear in the second edition about the issue of power um, and power imbalance or abuse of power being key concepts, um, particularly in the notion that sort of in any relationship we have their inherent power dif differentials. Um, but that essentially the abuse of power quite often is one of the drivers behind uh, breaking boundaries and then um, moving into abuse so uh, we're, ex we're expanding that within the second draft. Um, cultural safety also, we had a strong feedback from the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Catholic Council um, to further explore the notion of cultural safety. And so they're working with us on that. That's a concept that's already in the edition one of the standards, but we really want to um, expand uh, on that and support people um, to be able to meet expectations. And then um, I'm getting really close to the end. Um, the other, the last three issues really from um, the vulnerable adult work to date, um, one that came up that we hadn't really thought of, um, it came essentially from the um, eparchies and also um, Our Lady of the Southern Cross Ordinariate, where there are married priests and then a consideration about the term that was used was the extended priestly family members um, and that related back to some of those issues around power um, so we're working with a small cohort of that uh, group of epikies and the ordinary to really unpack what that would look like in the standards and how that would be best managed um, and then the last two uh, really interesting points i think um, and they probably have a, a, a view both ways so the first one there is that the work of the expanding the standards to cover adults is, is groundbreaking in a way. So we would be the first um, Catholic um, jurisdiction, if you like, in terms of a bishops conference anyway, to or an, an, a national ecclesial group to be um, tackling a set of standards for the protection of adults in the church. So Ireland, the US, England, um, Scotland, many, New Zealand, many other jurisdictions have, have looked at safeguarding from a child's perspective and have various arrangements around standards, requirements, audits, reviews, whatever. We're, we're all doing something a little bit similar, um, but no one yet has done anything around adults within the church. So in that sense, it is groundbreaking. Um, so messages around that was it's too important to rush um, other messages were there are there are issues so we should be dealing with this we shouldn't we shouldn't be waiting any longer um, but also that it will have a significant impact on the church and there is a risk that it raises expectations without perhaps the skills the support um, and the commitment from within the church to to live up to a higher level of expectation so we're grappling with that at the moment with the board um, and uh, the other one was that the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards are not Catholic enough, um, which probably was a bit, um, uh, you know, um, interesting feedback. Um, and there seems to have, but there's a, quite a significant pushback um, in the feedback from the, the recent consultation that the rights approach, the rights based approach is not right. We should just be talking about dignity, not rights. Um, and so that's a real tension for us in the team around um, 
you know, the notion of respecting someone's dignity but still being able to sort of abuse them because you don't recognise them as a rights holder. So we're looking at that and exploring that with some of those expert groups as well to see um, and we'll, we'll put something back to our board at the November meeting in terms of the next draft of the, the adult standards. So that's essentially where we're at and what, uh, what the issues are that have, have come up in that process. So to finalise... Um, we really have, if we go back to the notion of commitment, awareness and action, hopefully you've got a sense tonight that we have witnessed clear commitment um, and increasing awareness, and that is a continuing uh, piece of work around continuing to spread the word and increase awareness. And we've seen lots of significant action as hopefully I've given some examples of tonight, but there are definitely still challenges um, ahead. Um, there is a attention, uh, and I think constantly, both at a national level and in, in, in any organisation and ministry, um, around the cost of prevention versus the cost of responding. And it's not just in safeguarding, it's been in my whole career, um, that quite often the, the, um, the crisis or the, um, the, um, the claim or the complaint gets the energy um, and at the cost really of the prevention work, which will hopefully stop those claims into the future and stop those complaints. Um, so I think that's a, a constant tension about how you balance that. Um, there, is, there are issues um, all the time, have been the whole time I've been in the job, around sharing expertise um, and experience within and across entities. So the church is very siloed. Um, and quite often within a diocese, we still don't see um, we've seen some good practice, but there are, there are still lots of examples where um, the expertise and experience is not shared for the benefit of children. So it comes back to that Royal Commission um, notion of putting the children at the centre. If the children are at the centre, it doesn't matter which part of the church you're in, children should be your focus. Um, uh, ensuring our responses are fit for purpose. I think, again, there's a tension there for the church around this notion of a national response to some things. Uh, code of conduct is an example for me. A notion of having a national code of conduct um, sounds good in practice, uh, sounds good in theory, sorry. But when you come to practice, a code of conduct actually is a tool for you to manage when something's going wrong. And if you've got a really broad principle-based code of conduct, you can't deal with problems. You can't You can't reinforce. It needs to really be socialised to your particular ministry or institute or, or diocese and um, so I think that's a tension too about how much we can share and have one national approach and how much actually needs to be um, recognizing the differences in our ministries and the last um, challenge probably not the last but of the ones I was thinking about when I was preparing this talk is really that um, constant need to be challenging the notions that were that the leaders identified in some of those barriers to the culture change so challenging the sort of complacency. Um, I've had it said to me in, in the last few months, the Royal Commission's done, the church has moved on, we don't need to worry about this anymore. That, that horrifies me and chills me to the core. So I think we have to continue to tackle that sort of attitude and complacency if we're really going to achieve um, cultural change. So to finish before I, I hand back to Kevin. Uh, many of you will have seen this um, quote from Robert Fitzgerald. I, Robert was one of the commissioners, as many of you would know. I think it's a perfect quote, and in a way it sort of summarises what we were talking about, what I've tried to talk about tonight, that he's convinced that creating child safe institutions needs three things, a community of commitment, knowledge, and conversation. So I think tonight we've demonstrated there is strong commitment across the church. There is increasing knowledge and awareness, but the challenge continues to be that we have the conversation um, and not uh, let this drop off the agenda or go back to being uh, some sort of uh, a secret. So I hope you'll continue to join me in that conversation as we continue to journey to create a safe church. Thank you. Kevin, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. 
How long? How long do we get to, to used to this thing? Thank you so much uh, for um, a creative and challenging uh, 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 presentation of a, a very wide scope. I think um, the, the 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 point of culture just comes through again and again, isn't it? It's uh, it, this is not just about ticking boxes. It's about a way of being and a way of being motivated both by our gospel. <laughs> But but also um, by the cries we hear, you know, the cry of um, those who end up on the wrong end of of, of the misuse of, of power. So thank thank you so much. It's very challenging. So I invite us to engage with um, with Cherie uh, from from your own perspectives, your own organisations, um, to get us sort of moving and to begin um, generating some reflection, some response. I'd, I'd invite Audrey Brown to lead us off in some response. Uh, Audrey has a broad experience in leadership in Catholic education uh, as, a, as a school leader in Catholic high schools and a system leader around Victoria and most recently as the director of Catholic education in the Diocese of Ballarat, very fine diocese uh, since 2012 until now and now moving into consultancy. Uh, Audrey, would you like to unmute yourself and 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 uh, lead us off in a response to Cherie's presentation? Thanks, Kevin. Um, and uh, I do come to the, this reflection tonight um, with many hats on. That you mentioned some. I also now work with um, religious institute and ministerial PJP organisations in Victoria. Um, and uh, and just this afternoon, I was sitting at the Senate of of CTC. So, um, you know, I, it, it's with that lens that I, I respond to Cherie now. And so for those of us in any ministry, Cherie, and obviously my ministry is broad these days, um, you throw out a continued call for us uh, as we work with our communities to build that culture of continuous improvement around safeguarding. And uh, you, you you also reminded us of what an excellent framework we have in that one set of national Catholic safeguarding standards. For me, the, the fact that it is one set is really important. Um, it also challenges us, um, I think, to work continually towards a more integrated culture of commitment, awareness and action for cultural change. Um, it occurs to me that uh, your address tonight sits well alongside Pope Francis's latest encyclical Fratelli Tutti. That also challenges us to be enablers or agents of cultural change. Um, two of the challenges that you named in particular struck me tonight. Um, one about overcoming complacency to achieve real cultural change and the other to share our expertise across entities. And it appears to me that that's the message that Francis is giving us in Fratelli Tutti as well. Um, I'd add another challenge to the list and Cherie, you, um, you laughed or no, not laughed, you um, smiled as you mentioned this one um, earlier as a challenge about something more Catholic in those standards. Um, that's for us, I think, to articulate anew the connection between our approach to the safeguarding of children and adults at risk in a way that gives living witness to our understanding of the dignity of the human person. Um, Rana writes that um, in their openness to God, children communicate the divine love to all those whose hearts and minds are open. I wonder, are our hearts and minds open enough both to witness to the love of God um, and to discern the face of Christ in the children and adults we encounter in all their humanity in our ministries? Um, in Fratelli Tutti, we read um, that as visible images of the invisible God, human persons possess a transcendent dignity. They're therefore, by their very nature, the subjects of rights that no one may violate. And so in our various ministries, putting the child or the adult at risk at the centre of any response